Hi. In the previous video, we noticed that the debiasing technique that's using linear projections has limits. Sure, we saw that based on cosine distance, we're able to filter away some of the information in the Jenner direction. However, when we went ahead and trained machine learning models with these embeddings, then we saw that a simple scikit-learn classifier got about 90% accuracy here in predicting the gender, while still having about 81% accuracy here, suggesting that our debiasing technique only filters a little bit of information away. Now what I would like to do in this video is just on an intuitive mathematical level, try to explain why this trick doesn't work. Because I can imagine it's very counterintuitive. We saw a huge difference in the charge to our left so why isn't this accuracy closer to 50%? While explaining this, we're probably going to learn something more about word embeddings. But let's now once again repeat what the trick actually is that we're applying here. So as a reminder, here's how the projection trick works. Let's say that we have four word embeddings, king, queen, man, and woman then we might be able to point out that there is something of a gender direction. If you think about the direction from man to woman, you might consider that it's similar to the direction of from king to queen. So that means that you can come up with this gender axis. Now, the idea behind the debiasing technique is to say, well, let's come up with a projection away from that gender, away from the gender axis. And the way that you construct this is you come up with a space that is at 90 degree angle of the gender axis. The idea here being, if I start at the origin and project away, then as far as this gender axis is concerned, zero would start here and, and there should be no gender information along this line. And this might suggest that you can project all of the words back onto this neutral axis. And that's what you see here. So king and queen hopefully might represent royalty a bit more as opposed to being a gendered term. And man, woman might mean gender a bit more as opposed to which gender. That's the theory at least anyway. And what we also said is, well, in higher dimensions, this is no longer an axis. This might be a plane, but here's where we kept that argument. What I want to do now is check what happens if we do this in a higher dimension. The argument is easy to understand in two dimensions, but let's just see what happens if we were to do the same trick, but now in a 3D space. So here's a visualization of 3D word embeddings. And there's a few things to point out with this chart. For starters, these are not actual word embeddings. This is a hypothetical example. But what I've assumed here is that there are these clusters of words that might appear and that we also have this direction that could represent gender. And to be specific, it's this direction. So for argument's sake, let's say that this is our gender axis. And to emphasize this gender axis, what I've done is I have colored all the dots, all the embeddings, so to say, on this axis. So the darker green colors are on this side and the more light colors are on this side of the spectrum, so to say. And then in this particular case, because I'm in three dimensions, if I were doing this projection trick one more time, well then a few things would change. I would no longer be projecting to a line. Instead, I will be projecting on a plane. And in particular, it would be this one. And that is because this two-dimensional plane has a 90 degree angle with this gender axis while also touching the origin. And that would mean, for example, that I would take this point over here and then I would project that down until it hits this plane. And similarly, there might be a point here that I'm moving down over here, but there's also a couple of points that lie below that plane and I would be bringing up those. This is what our debiasing trick would look like if it was in three dimensions. So what I've just described has now happened in the chart on the right over here. And because lots of points are drawn, it might be somewhat hard to see. 
but all the points that were originally green are now purple and they are now on that plane. All of these points have now been projected to this 2D flat space. And again, it deserves to be stressed that this is happening in three dimensions. If we were doing this to actual word embeddings, these things would be happening in a much higher dimensional space. But considering we have now done our debiasing technique in three dimensions as opposed to two, we can now start wondering what properties we may or may not be able to expect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace this chart and I'm going to effectively zoom in on all the points that have been projected onto this yellow plane. And then we'll think about what we see. So just for emphasis, what I have here on the left is the original embedding, while here I have the debiased version. And one thing to point out, for example, is that this axis over here has completely different numbers compared to what we have on the left-hand side. All the points have been smushed onto a two-dimensional plane. The things that effectively are the same are this X and Y coordinate system, but it is this Z axis over here that's gotten a complete redo. But there's one other thing that remained the same as well, and that's the color of the points. All the words that were originally very high up on the gender axis had a dark green color, and the words on the other end of the axis had a very light color. And this brings us back to the debiasing question. This new debiased space that we have over here, can we really say that there is no more bias there? If the dark green colors correspond with the male end of the gender axis, and the lighter green colors correspond with the female end of the gender axis, then it's still easy for me to come up with a machine learning algorithm to separate the two words into these two groups. If I were to get a classifier and it would get this new debiased space, then it can quite easily come up with some sort of boundary on this two-dimensional plane, where on this one end you would have more of the male words, and on this other side you would have more of the female words. And you would have that in the original embedding as well, except here the shape is probably a bit more complex because we have to construct something that lives in a high dimensional space where everything on this side is male and everything on this side might be female. But just doing this linear projection should not be considered as enough as far as debiasing goes. So I hope it's clear that we should still be concerned with bias in our word embeddings even after applying this linear algebra trick. I would also like to take the time to point out another downside of this projection. Remember how in an earlier video we saw that the relative distances between the points barely changed? Well, that's because the clusters remain intact. This cluster over here is still over here. And you can imagine, also in a high dimensional setting, that the relative distance between all of these embeddings hasn't really changed that much. And if that holds for that cluster, it probably holds for this cluster over here too. And I hope that by now, when looking at it in this three-dimensional way, that we recognize that the technique that we had at our disposal, that it's kind of overfitting on this cosine distance metric. A lot of the other issues with bias that we have in embeddings basically still persist. We need more than just a linear algebra trick at our disposal to compensate for all of that. And especially if we're going to be using word embeddings as a pre-processing step, then we should be especially careful in suggesting that a linear projection is going to completely debias our word embeddings. Now, I'll show you one more visualization to hopefully make it clear that this debiasing trick really only works on cosine distance. So as a final visualization, let's have a look at the charts that we started this series out with. These are the cosine similarity charts for the largest English byte pair embedding. And what we can see is that indeed there is a little bit of this similarity here that's now gone here, and this is after we apply the projection. But it should be said that the distance measure here is all cosine based. And as a reminder, the cosine distance between two vectors says something about the angle between them. You could wonder, well, that angle is of course a distance measure, 
But the issue with that is that if I have another vector that's, let's say, almost at the same angle, but a lot further away in embedding space, then the cosine distance will be really small, even though the Euclidean distance, which is the distance between the arrowheads, so to say, will be very big. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the same chart, but instead of using this cosine distance, I'll be using this Euclidean distance. And we'll just see if the chart has the same shape. So this is the before chart made with Euclidean distance. And here's the after. And when you look at it this way, you really have to squint your eyes to see any difference. If you zoom in on this part, you're gonna see a very minor change. But by and large, it really just looks the same. So if you're correcting for cosine distance, it might just be that the Euclidean distance barely changes. In this small series on bias in word embedding space, I've mainly been talking about bias that is linked to gender. Now, it deserves to be emphasized that that's just zooming in on one kind of bias. You should also expect bias on religion or ethnic backgrounds to also be present in these word embeddings. There is one thing to point out though about gender bias in particular that also highlights why this bias problem is so hard. I've been focusing a lot on the algorithmic part of the problem in this video, but it's worth to highlight another aspect. The way that I've been describing gender in word embedding space here is by defining this axis, where I'm suggesting that all the male words are on one side of the spectrum and all the female words are on the other side. Now, the main benefit of this is that you can say things like, oh, the direction that I have over here is very similar to the direction over here. You're able to quantify things more this way. However, part of the big issue here is that you can ask a really serious question. Can we really reduce gender identity and how that's being used in language as a straight line in embedded space? Or is that just a gross oversimplification? We have to be really careful with associating meaning to these vectors. For example, what might it mean if you're exactly in the middle here? If there's a word in the middle there, does that mean that the word is gender neutral? Or does that mean that it's non-binary? The fact that the answer to this question is not obvious demonstrates the limits of this male-female analogy. Now, these analogies in general are also things you're going to have to be very careful with because there are many situations in which they simply don't hold. For example, let's think about non-English languages just briefly. In German, you have three grammatical genders, der, die, and das, where the idea is that der refers to the masculine words, die to the feminine, and we also have one for the neutral. Also here, it's not necessarily obvious to say that das is supposed to be in the middle of die and der. And then there are languages like Turkish, where instead of the notion of he and she, people often refer to the neutral O. But it's exactly this that also demonstrates what's so hard about bias in word embeddings. It can be really subtle and hard to quantify, and language is a inherently hard problem. So the main lesson here is to remain careful when you're assuming properties of word embeddings. The main thing that seems safe to say is that if you have pre-trained word embeddings that are trained on large chunks of the internet, that there's gonna be bias in there. And what also seems to be the case is that it's really hard to get rid of. How exactly this bias propagates? That's really hard to predict. So that means that probably the best place to think about how to deal with these embeddings and bias is in the application. If there's a big risk that your application can cause harm to people because of the bias in the embeddings, then maybe it remains a really good idea to not automate everything in our applications and to keep a human in the loop, just to make sure that we have a healthy feedback mechanism to prevent a whole lot of harm.